start off with five people, and we're going to buff Scrub Shop Work and, and sell this thing. And uh, lo and behold, we make it make thirty thousand dollars three months later. So April it turns profitable. We've we've had a sixty thousand dollar a month delta in profits, and we're we're off to the races. And so we decide in our wisdom to clone Scrub Shopper into uh, this little business called Tough Love. So it was a workwear business. And we went from $3 million to $6 million basically overnight. And so we're not geniuses, but we said, hey, we'll, we'll enter 20 different industries here. We'll clone it around. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll build a $60 million business. Three times 20 is 60, and, and now we're really going to be rich. And at that time, Terry and I looked at each other and said, maybe this is the thing we want to build. Maybe we want to do this rather than getting out of this so we can do something else. And so that day, I remember it pretty vividly. We sat down and said, we want to do two things. We want to build a billion dollar e-commerce business in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And that, if that's not crazy enough, we also want to build uh, an infrastructure for startups and help the scene around here. There was no scene for startups. No, nothing like this existed. My goodness, this is incredible. I just feel honored to be here. Um, same thing's going on south of 412 down in Fayetteville. We've got a bunch of uh, scrappy young college students starting uh, internet type businesses. We've got a bunch of scrappy young uh, people up here starting CBT type businesses. So it's, it's pretty incredible uh, to see the evolution uh, that's happened over the last five years. I don't know if we had a, any, anything to do with it, but I'm, I'm really glad that we, uh, you know, we're at least part of uh, that happening. So we're going to build a billion dollar e-commerce business and we're going to help uh, mentor uh, startups and founders, uh, et cetera, and, and build a great team. Yeah, it would happen. We were five people in a doctor's office. But uh, lo and behold, uh, here we sit today um, and it's, it's been pretty incredible. So five people, we raised first round of venture capital, we raised $3 million from this group called Nora Mosley uh, out of Atlanta. And with that, we went on our mission to clone this thing 18 different times. We got about halfway through it and the damn thing wasn't working. Uh, so we kept beating our hand against the wall and said, well, let's just do one more. And that one more, uh, before we abandoned this model, was country outfit. There's no S on there, but <clears throat> not the first. Every, in fact, there's more search for country outfitters than country outfitter, which maybe we ought to change the name. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got both trademarked or patented or whatever Smith Hurst does for us. They're great, by the way. Um, so, um, so we raised this $3 million and we're about to run out of money and Country Outfitter uh, comes along and uh, by chance, uh, Alex Dillard, uh, president of Dillard's, heard that we had these cool little robots. And so we've got these orange robots, they're 250 pounds, we have about 50 of them, they drive around and pick orders up off the floor and they drive them over to the picker and it completely changes things. So we're, we've got this world-class fulfillment center going down in, in, in Fayetteville. Mr. Dillard heard about it and he drove up one afternoon and, and, and I was on vacation so I didn't have time to plan for this meeting. He walks in and give him a tour, he kind of likes what he sees. I said, Mr. Dillard, um, <laughs> we're, we need to raise five million dollars and I'd like you to invest in our company. He stood up and shook my hand and Funding doesn't happen that way. So we, we got really lucky and uh, had Dillard's in our company, which, which really extended our lifeline. They didn't know it at the time, but we were kind of struggling. We were on the, on the edge of uh, needing to do something pretty, uh, pretty dramatic, pretty drastic. So um, I say all that to lead up to the e-commerce 1.0, e-commerce 2.0, e-commerce uh, 3.0. But I'll finish off the story here and I'll back up and do what I'm actually uh, here for. Um, so Dillard's invests. Uh, and uh, they invested in this tired old Google model where you, someone would type in a keyword term, I'd send them to a landing page and I'd extract a few pennies from them. And we knew there was something better out there and uh, Facebook was it. So I kind of sat in my basement. Terry says I left the office and disappeared for two weeks. I don't know if this is Urban Ledger or not, but he says I walk back in there and I say I figured out Facebook. And lo and behold, uh, about three months after that, we had about six million Facebook. We literally went from zero fans to six million fans uh, in, in the span of about three months. So I'm running this little business that uh, went from three million to six million to nine million dollars of revenue. Uh, we almost went bankrupt. We almost burned through three or four million dollars of uh, capital and luckily Mr. Dillard threw us a bone and uh, allowed us to keep innovating. And now here I sit running something on, on about a hundred million dollar run rate uh, that was expected to do about $16 million uh, in that year. 
So needless to say, the supply chain broke. The uh, Nothing good was going on. Hair was on fire everywhere. We scaled up from, I think we had 15, 16, 18 people at the time, up to 100 people uh, in the span of about two or three months. And this is all during the Christmas holidays. So we've got a business that's supposed to do 16 million all year, and it does about 16 million in the first 20 days of December. Crap. So first world problems, right? Champagne problems. Um, and so now here we sit, and we've got every venture capitalist in the world flying in here. We've got Sequoia Capital that backed Google and, uh, and, and Apple and uh, everybody else. You've got Bain Capital, Mitt Romney's group, they come in. You've got all the East Coast, all the West Coast groups competing for this little bitty stupid company run by a doctor uh, out of Arkansas. And so we settle on this group called General Atlantic. There's a guy named Anton Levy who's one of my heroes. He's a, he sits on my board, so it's really cool to get to interact with this guy. He was actually, he led the Alibaba investment. It was probably the single most impressive uh, private equity investment in the last um, 100 years. I mean, I can't imagine one being more successful than, than what Alibaba was. Um, he's also on the board of Guilt Group, which they're going to go public probably in the next year or so. Uh, he did web.com back in the day. This guy's a hitter, and for him to fly into Fayetteville, Arkansas and meet with us every, every month, it's, 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 it's very humbling and very, uh, very fun to do with him. So we raised $104 million total over three rounds. Um, coming from a guy that's used to bootstrapping, you know, dude, this is my fourth company, I'd never raised a dime before this, and now here I said, uh, I guess I'm bipolar, either do things none of the way or, or, or all the way. So we raised $104 million, it was really all around our customer acquisition talents. Um, so going back to the e-commerce 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 stories that I uh, alluded to. So how, can, how does this relate to you guys? Um, I think it, I think it, I need to take lessons from what we learned. I, it, obviously not going to be completely applicable to a, to a CPG firm. But uh, I'll tell you what we do, and, and maybe you can find uh, how, how it relates to your particular business. So you come one point up. So you go to Google, uh, you type in the word cowboy boots. Um, my ad shows up. Uh, when you click it, I send you a page called cowboy boots, and it's related to cowboy boots, and, uh, and you buy some percentage of the time. So that's e-commerce 1.0. It's, it's what I like to call an arbitrage business model. It's, it's very linear. Uh, about 99% of the, the, the benefit happens within 30 minutes of that first click. So the math is pretty easy to determine. If you're making more contribution margin than you're paying on a, uh, on a per click basis, then you've got something viable. If you're making less, it doesn't work. And so the math is very easy there. And people have been doing this literally since 1998, since Overture launched. Uh, which Google relentlessly stole uh, for their AdWords thing, which was the best innovation, probably you know, one of the best in the history of business. But it, like I said, it's very linear. Um, in 2001, when we started Grill Stuff, it was really easy. I could buy the word grill for a penny or a nickel. Uh, people would come over and I'd make several dollars per click. So the arbitrage was easy. You didn't even need to do the math. You didn't need to be very sophisticated to make it work. Well, today that word barbecue grill or, or auto racing helmet or cowboy boot it's almost fully priced. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, I pay uh, about a dollar and eighty cents per click on the word cowboy boots. I make about a dollar eighty-five. So it's a very tight market. And uh, what happens is, on Google, the, the top three positions are very competitive. About eighty-five percent of the clicks come on those top three positions that lay at the very top of Google. Uh, if you're outside of those, you've got the sidebar and then page two and page three and page four. All the traffic on positions three through infinity accounts for only about 15% of the click. So you're going to be invisible unless you're up there uh, on the top one, two, or three positions. So we fight and we're relentless and we, we build all this technology just to extract an extra penny or two or three out of each, uh, each uh, keyword click. So uh, we A-B test our landing pages. So we literally have probably 20 A-B tests running across our site today just to sell more calipers. Down to the pixel, we've tested everything on there. The other thing we do is uh, real-time algorithmic bidding. So we're basically a hedge fund for buying keywords. Um, it's no different than a hedge fund would trade stock markets. We trade uh, keywords. So I say all that to say, if you've got a niche and you are unique and there are keywords that you can target, it's still possible to do. If you think you're going to go out on the word furniture or something very broad, good luck. It's already priced in. You're going to lose. Nordstrom's going to kill you. Uh, Saks is going to kill you. Uh, Dillard's is going to kill you. Walmart and Amazon. They don't even try it. Uh, so if you've got something completely differentiated that people search for, on the other hand, 
uh, you can come in uh, and, uh, and make a little bit of difference. So that's e-commerce 1.0. Uh, great business model until Amazon and Walmart and everybody big screwed it up. Uh, they're all really good at it and they've got a hundred guys that look like me and talk like me and act like me and they went to MIT and I went to this little university down the road here so it's hard to compete in this post Amazon post Walmart world in that Ecom 1.0. Commerce 2.0, I, I'd like to say we had a little bit of uh, uh, luck in pioneering this. I don't think uh, a lot of people were successful in pushing e-commerce or uh, products or whatever uh, in Facebook before about 2011. So think about this. Person's on their Facebook account and they're scrolling through and they're looking at pictures of their old high school girlfriend and they're looking at pictures of what happened at this party the other night and they're looking at uh, oh look, a Halloween costume. Oh, Alex is dressed up like a flea. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're going to ram a, a picture of a cowboy boot or a picture of a bottle of water or a picture of, I mean, your, your insert for the water. I mean, it, it's not going to work. I mean, think about it. It's just not going to work. Uh, they're not in buying mode. They are in discovery mode. They are in entertainment mode. And so when someone searches for the word cowboy boots, I convert about 3% of them into sales. I ram a boot into somebody's Facebook feed, uh, even someone who likes country music or, or rodeo or horses or whatever, I, I'm going to convert them at 0.1%. So one out of 1,000 versus 30 out of 1,000. So it's 30x less viable of a strategy for customer acquisition. So we had to change the game. We came in and said, all right, we like boots. You like boots. Let's be buddies. Uh, and so what we did is we established a relationship so it started with beautiful artwork, beautiful imagery, and we said, hey, here's a beautiful picture of a beautiful boot. Don't you like it? Uh, if you do, follow us, give us your email address, and, and we'll send you these every day. And so it was a relationship we struck up with them. And uh, the math, when it worked, it was probably the most incredible thing I've ever watched. I mean, literally, we were, we were growing our business every week about 11%, and that 11% compounded over 36 straight weeks. So you go from being this little bitty lazy shop that was in a doctor's office not a couple of years ago uh, to this thing that's got Sequoia uh, and General Atlantic and all these firms not only talking to us but actually flying on their jets and coming to Fable to meet us. So um, it worked. Uh, we established a relationship and then what we did is we email them every day. So we have this um, a couple things happen there. So number one, on a Google model, every time they search for cowboy boots, I've got to pay to reacquire this customer. On a Facebook model, I actually have some connection to them. So I can push content through them through, uh, through their Facebook feed. Uh, we ask for their email address. We almost require everyone who uses our site to give us their email address. And paradoxically, that seems stupid because I put a barrier in front of them uh, actually being able to purchase from us. What we found is, uh, yeah, I piss off 70% 70 70 of the people that come into my website, but the 30% that do give me uh, their email address are much, much more valuable than the 70% that, that we piss off because of the relationship we establish. So with this model, uh, you can start to do personalization. In a Google model, you have no idea of who this person is. There's some random Joe that just first heard the word cowboy boot. On this, I know him as John M. James at gmail.com, and, uh, and John likes boots with harnesses on them, and he's an aggressive uh, type guy, and he's not a redneck. He doesn't have a tramp stamp in the, in the middle of his back. Uh, he, he likes Taylor Swift. He doesn't like Miranda Lambert. Uh, and, and so if you like Taylor Swift, you like different boots than if you like Miranda Lambert. And so you start to learn all these patterns through, through big data. So now I can, in my email, I can push out things to this person, uh, tailored to who they are and what they like and, and why they like it. Other thing you can do uh, when you have their email address and when you have their Facebook fan and when you have a cookie on their machine where you can track them like Big Brother uh, is, and you have to be careful with that by the way, um, and, and very cognizant of it and very, you have to respect it. It's a privilege. Uh, to me to be able to email about 11 million people a day. Um, it, it's a privilege. Uh, it's something these people can take away from you if you abuse it. It's something people can, um, and so I joke around about it, but it, it literally is, that's not how we, how we view it. So I've got 11 million people. Uh, some, one of them comes to my website and hits various pieces uh, of the site. Well, I can follow up then with them uh, through data. So if they looked at a red boot, I can send them that exact red boot in an email the next day. And if after 48 hours they haven't bought it, I can give them a 10% discount. And if after 72 hours they still haven't bought it, I can give them free shipping and a 10% discount. And I can keep layering on things. 
And so our coupon usage, we're not going to vomit a coupon out to, uh, to retailmenot.com or someplace like that. We're going to come in and hyper-target the coupons because if, if the person can pay full price and is willing to pay full price, why, why wouldn't we let them? Uh, if they need a little bit of a push uh, down the, down the uh, purchase funnel, well, let's, let's do it. Let's start with a gentle nudge and then if you have to, pull out your sledgehammer because they're gone to the world after about 72 hours once they've uh, been to the site. So that's e-commerce 2.0. Um, we believe we were a little bit of uh, pioneers in that. Uh, you're starting to see a lot of other people do very similar things. Um, it's um, it's pretty neat to see. With that, how much time do I have? You have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh wow! <laughs> that's all the time in the world. Um, so e-commerce 3.0 uh, to me is how you survive in a post Amazon, post Walmart world. <laughs> if it's got a UPC code, guys, Amazon's already won online. They've won. Uh, Walmart is trying to catch up even. Do you want to compete with that? I mean, none of us are good enough to compete against probably the two best companies in the world, uh, or two best retailers in the world. And so what we've said is, all right, we're this business, and we've got an asset. We've got the ears of about 11 million people that like uh, country music, that like rodeo, that like horses, that like uh, hunting, that like fishing. So how do we leverage that into a sustainable, viable business model? And the way we started was selling other people's stuff. So Ariat, Justin, Corral, um, you know, we're just a retailer of other people's booths. Well, Amazon owns Zappos. Well, I can see the writing on the wall. They're going to beat us at some point unless we differentiate ourselves uh, pretty dramatically uh, from Zappos. Not only that, Zappos does free shipping both ways, and they've got these people wearing like fur coats answering the phone, being weird and stuff, and they love it on you when you call in. And so, so that's real expensive, by the way. Um, so uh, customer service is what they said. And we said, we're going to differentiate ourselves based on a unique differentiated product that you can't buy anywhere else. And so what we did is we leveraged the relationship we have with 7 million fans and 11 million email addresses uh, and, and basically crowdsourced the designs of our boots. So uh, we, we came out with about 150 designs of boots. Uh, put them out to our Facebook wall and said, which ones do you like? And it was pretty incredible. It was Pareto's principle to a T. It was 80 for the 20. 20% of the boots got 80% of the likes. If you, and if you take the 20, top 20% and divide it down into another 80-20 rule, you've got like five boots out of these 150 that really raise their hand and say, oh my gosh, these boots are killer. So we went to Mexico and established a manufacturing relationship and built these boots. Uh, put them out on our website, crossed our fingers, and lo and behold, those five boots were uh, five of our top uh, 50 boots uh, across our entire website. Competing against companies that have been around for 120 years. So Justin and Luke Casey and brands that yeah, even cowboy boots wearers probably have not heard of, or probably have heard of. So we took that principle and, and we said, all right, what are the holes in the market? How can we crowdsource more and more of these boots? Uh, how can we build this vertically integrated supply chain from design to manufacturing uh, to the end user? And so that's kind of the, the, the frontier for us. We believe that we can do that. We can be that billion dollar company. Uh, we believe we can go public. Um, and we've got a, a three to five year horizon uh, for, uh, for, for building that. Um, so uh, e-commerce 1.0. Strictly an arbitrage business. Really nice when it was five cent clicks, really bad when it's two dollar clicks. Um, E-commerce 2.0, establish the relationship. Um, get their email address. Uh, push content. Ask them things. Uh, learn. Big data drives it. E-commerce 3.0 is actually trying to make money uh, off of a relationship and building something uh, that is uh, completely unique and completely differentiated and frankly built by the crowd. When you think about how uh, I love these guys at Ariad, I love the guys at Justin, we're, we're really good friends, but when you think about the way they design boots, it's a bunch of old dudes sitting around a room saying, yeah, I think little Missy liked wearing these cowboy boots, and, and that's what they build. It's, there's not a lot of logic on it. It's, it's two or three or four people designing for millions. And what we did is, is turn on his head and said, I want millions deciding what we should build based on our uh, designs. And so far, so good. I'll tell you, five years have worked. Yeah, it, it, it may or may not work. So, uh, got a couple minutes left. I'll take any question. Yes. Have you uh, had any experience with WeChat? With WeChat? Yeah. So, uh, customer service pop up when they're on the page, and you proactively ask them if 
if they found what they're looking for? Is that what you're talking no, about? No, it's, um, it's in Asia. And okay. it, now that Alibaba is in China and all everything's changing very rapidly, mm -hmm. the main thing that they're using is called WeChat. And mm -hmm. it takes Facebook, eBay, <coughs> every single thing and puts it in one place. And, mm -hmm. and it's really like the big thing that they're using. And so people are looking, how do we get into that? How yeah. do we? Well, if you look at WeChat, WhatsApp, uh, all the new emerging things, Snapchat I'd even put in this uh, type category. Um, how you leverage the new emerging uh, platforms is it, probably crucial. Because once a market trends towards perfection, it's hard to arbitrage. So Google, hard to arbitrage. Facebook in the early days, easy to arbitrage. Uh, Hard to arbitrage today. I can't do what I did three years ago today on Facebook. The math doesn't work. Um, and so, yeah, if you can if you can use a WeChat or a Snapchat or, or some of these other things that are that are new and out there, and you can buy penny clicks before they're when they're really worth two dollars. Uh, the arbitrage of nation systems is really uh, to me how uh, new businesses jump through and uh, are formed. I didn't answer your question, but I talked around it's, it a little. It's, no, really like yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure that's out. What it so is. It's so new. Okay. Yeah, it really is. And if you can find it, be on the leading edge rather than the bleeding edge, you you win. If you had a company with a product, would you invest more time in trying to build an online business or trying to get into Walmart and Target and? I think it feeds on itself. If you can if you can get social proof online. Um, and we're finding this through our private label brands. So we, we built Independent Boots, which is kind of like a fry boot. It's pretty mainstream. We built uh, Eight Second Angel, which is your tramp stamp on the back, and it's awesome. It's aggressive, and it's hardcore country music. Uh, and then you get Rebel Boots, which is Kid Rock. It's, you know, James Dean. It's, it's that kind of rebel. And so what we found is, if we once we've found social proof, and each of those have a, a little over 50,000 Facebook fans each, they're three or four months old. When you go to the retailer and say, hey, I got 50,000 fans, it's killing it online. That's what they want these days. I don't know if it's the same with Walmart, but I know it is in, in kind of your fashion, trendy uh, business. So a, so a Dillard's or a Macy Sachs Nordstrom's. Uh, if you don't have that social proof online, they're not going to let you in the door. It's almost table stakes these days. I'm it. sorry, but what is arbitrage? Arbitrage is buying something uh, for uh, less than it's worth. So if I pay a nickel and make a dollar, uh, it's great. So the classic arbitrage example is, let's say General Atlantic or General Electric or Walmart stock trades on a European stock exchange or an American stock exchange. If you notice that uh, GE is trading at twenty-seven dollars and thirty cents on in Europe, you buy it and then immediately thirty seconds later sell it for twenty-seven fifty over on uh, on the U.S. stock exchange. So that's arbitrage. All right, you got a time?